Hi everyone, nothing like being the last talk between people and beer, so bear with me. Um, I'm a software engineer at Facebook. I've been there about two and a half years and I'm on a team responsible for the kind of control plane of our custom network switches. But don't worry, not here to talk about that. Instead, I'm here to talk about a couple of projects in the larger networking org, which is basically around how Facebook is working to connect the unconnected and help improve access for the underserved. So to begin, let's talk a bit about internet penetration. So currently there are about 3.5 billion people using the internet, but this number alone isn't really the whole picture. This map is a map of internet penetration as well as the number of people online. So the larger the country, the more people online, and the redder the country, the total percentage of the population of that country online. And the map excludes countries with less than half a million people online. So from this, you can see that internet users disproportionately come from the developed world. And even countries with a large number of total users have relatively low penetration. So for example, China has the most people connected to the internet in the world, but this accounts for only 52% of their overall population. And India, which has the second most people connected to the world, is even more striking, with, only, with internet penetration of only 15%. In fact, 75% of the world's internet users come from only 20 countries, which means that the remaining 178 countries have a combined internet presence of only about half a billion. So this pretty clearly shows that internet access is not evenly distributed in the geographical sense. So it's really important to contextualize raw numbers because internet access is becoming yet another divide between the developed and developing worlds. So you may be saying, but what about mobile internet? The future is mobile, all of that sort of stuff. And this kind of brings me to my next however. So there are 3.5 billion people using the internet. However, that doesn't really tell us about the quality of this access. So on this map, we have yellow representing 4G or LTE, with blue being 3G. And this is kind of a map of what, where there is good internet, kind of mobile broadband. And you can see that South Africa isn't doing too bad, at least in the population centers. This map, on the other hand, shows 2G in red, with purple being areas without any sort of connection. And definitely many of these areas are sparsely populated. For example, Canada is mostly purple because Canada is mostly a frozen wasteland. <laughs> but <laughs> apologies to Canadians. Um, Optimistic estimates still put the number of completely disconnected people at about 1.6 billion, which means it's really important to remember and realize that despite the massive impact that the internet has on all of our daily lives, uh, many people, in fact about a fifth of the world's population, remain completely unconnected. Which again is that communication technologies are not evenly distributed, and in this case I'm talking about connection speed. And this is especially pertinent to us here in sub-Saharan Africa, as this is one of the most poorly connected parts of the world, with less than 10% of the world's internet users and most of that 10% on 2G speeds. So to kind of summarize what I've been saying about internet penetration, 60% of the world doesn't use the internet. 20 countries account for 75% of all internet users, and there's relatively few people who have access to mobile broadband. Finally, there are 1.6 billion with no internet access at all. So there's still a lot of room for growth. And this, an increased mobile pe penetration alone is only gonna go so far because it requires increased investments in infrastructure and has diminishing returns. So hopefully I've convinced everyone that connectivity is still indeed a problem to be solved. And you may be going, so why, why, why Facebook? What does this have to do with Facebook? So when you think of Facebook, you're probably thinking of things like funny cat videos and stalking old classmates from high school. Totally legitimate use cases. Um, however, Facebook's overall goal is to make the world more open and connected. And here's a kind of pixelated picture of Mark Zuckerberg to make my point. At Facebook's F8 Developers Conference last year, Mark revealed Facebook's 10-year plan, which is basically to give everyone the power to share anything with anyone. And this is based around developing technology in three key areas. Connectivity, artificial intelligence, and virtual and augmented reality. Which is why I'm here today talking to you about internet penetration. Because connectivity plays an especially important role for us. If we want to reach this goal of being able to share anything with anyone, as well as in order to continue to grow our community and the company, we really have to help connect the world in the most literal of senses. 
So a couple of years ago, we launched the Connectivity Labs to develop new technology that can reduce the cost of deploying internet infrastructure. And basically, the aim is to connect the unconnected and improve the experience of the underserved. We're looking for order of magnitude improvements here, which make it possible to reach people where financially it, was, it wasn't sustainable before. So this said, we're not looking to actually build and operate networks ourselves. Instead, we're looking to advance technology to the point where they become viable solutions for existing operators and providers to deploy and manage themselves. So in order to kind of get started on this very broad problem, our first question is, where do people actually live? What is the density, layout, and distribution of human settlement? And this is actually a more difficult question than you might think. Existing census data is pretty coarse-grained and often incomplete. And this is a, an example of what census data can tell us. However, using satellite maps with help from our AI and data science teams, Facebook was able to achieve a much more granular view. And this allowed us to kind of better answer these questions in light of where people are actually living and how they're actually living. So we quickly realized that one solution doesn't really fit all. So we broke the problem up into low, medium, and high density areas. In low and medium population densities, the main problem is limited or no connectivity. These areas are often remote and difficult to reach, lacking basic infrastructure, even the roads required to bring in connectivity equipment. And in order to avoid a lot of these problems, we've mainly focused on aerial solutions. In high density areas, which can be like dense urban settlements to rural, the main problem is the quality of connectivity. With so many devices and limited connection points, interference and a lack of bandwidth can, be, can become real problems. And because these areas often already have access to internet via the ground, we've focused on terrestrial solutions. So I'm gonna start by talking about two of these terrestrial projects, Terragraph and Ares and both aim to improve the speed, efficiency, and quality of internet connectivity. And this is something that both the developed and developing world suffer from. In the developing world, mobile operators are often unable to achieve speeds better than 2G. While in the developing world, Wi-Fi and LTE infrastructure is unable to keep up with the growth caused by the consumption of videos and images at higher and higher resolutions. Thank you, Facebook. So you may be asking, do we really need some fancy new solution? Can't we fix this with existing technology we already have? Like, do we ne really need to make this more difficult than it is? So let's take a look at what some of this existing technology is. Generally, internet is provided in one of three ways, via copper or fiber optic cables, or through cellular base stations. And this is the world as it currently is. Copper, however, has limited bandwidth due to its physical nature. And, and while fiber handles the kind of issues of limited bandwidth by offering several gigabits of data transfer speed, the cables themselves and laying them are expensive and cumbersome as it requires actually digging up the earth, which means that it's not viable as a large-scale urban solution for most countries. Then on cellular frequencies, on the other hand, are generally toted as kind of the new way of connecting the unconnected. And this is, this is definitely true. From a technology perspective, this seems pretty ideal. However, it's impeded by a lack of spectrum. And that's because all cellular systems operate in licensed bands, which are expensive and not readily available to the extent needed to meet multi-gigabit demand. So the Connectivity Lab was tasked with improving existing solutions by an order of magnitude, finding ways to transfer more data faster for a lower cost. The first of these projects is ARIES, which stands for the Antenna Radio Integration for Efficiency and Spectrum. Uh, today, 4G and WLAN systems use MIMO, which stands for multiple input, multiple output. And the progression to 5G is generally thought to lie through massive MIMO, which uses a large number of antennas. ARIES is kind of the realization of this sort of technology. It consists of a base station with 96 antennas and supports 24 streams simultaneously over the same radio spectrum. And this is achieved through something called spatial multiplexing which in layman's terms basically just means that each antenna transmits multiple separately encoded streams, multiplexing the same time frequency resource. Not only that, but because, because of its long range, it can be used to beam 
internet to surrounding rural areas, which is pretty cool because it's an alternative not only to costly spectrum licensing, but also the costly procurement of additional base stations needed in order to traditionally reach these areas. The next thing I'm going to talk about, Terragraph, is also related to spectral licensing in some sense. So Terragraph is a multi-node wireless distribution network, which operates in the unlicensed 60 gigahertz bands. And it's optimized for high volume and low cost components using commercial YGIG off the shelf components. And this image kind of gives a visual introduction to Terragraph. Ignore the confidentiality NDA note there, it's fine. Um, <laughs> so we have two main types of nodes, distribution and client nodes. Distribution nodes make up the base of our multi-node tracking topology. And they emit, they emit data at at the 60 gigahertz frequency band. They use the cloud for intensive data processing and self-organizing the network. And they're generally placed on street lamps or robots or other so-called street furniture, which is basically anything that's outside and is unlikely to move. Client nodes, on the other hand, are placed on the sides of buildings. They're used as additional points of presence for Wi-Fi, for cellular small cells, or for bringing ethernet into buildings. And so this probably sounds and looks a lot like a mesh network, which isn't a particularly new idea for, bringing, for providing internet, especially in South Africa, which has had projects like this, like the Mesh Potato, with varying levels of success due in part to telecom. Um, another part of the issue has been consistently the issue of spectral licensing. And so this is South Africa's spectrum allocation chart. And it's important to remember it's logarithmic. And we're most interested in the millimeter wave spectrum, which is the bottom row from about 30 to 300 gigahertz. Comparatively, this range has an abundance of bandwidth and is seen as the most promising enabler of future high bandwidth communications. So you may be wondering what, I, what exactly I mean by an abundance here. So to give you an example, if you take all of the communication wireless system, wireless communications and broadcasting systems, so that's AM, FM radio, all of the t TV broadcasting bands, 2G, 3G, LT LTE, as well as all the Wi-Fi, ISM bands, this is less spectrum combined than what's available in 57 to 66 gigahertz. And it's important to realize that this graph is logarithmic, which means, well, this chart is logarithmic, which means that the range contained in the top couple of rows is only a really small part of the total in the bottom row. So it makes up a very small part of the bottom row. Most, millimeter wave, most of the millimeter wave spectrum is licensed for, for special use, except that is for the 57 to 64, 66 gigahertz in most parts of the world. And in, in most parts of the world, this is unlicensed or very lightly licensed. And this has a lot to do with its propagation characteristics. So 60 gigahertz for Terragraph. There are, seven, there are several standardization efforts around this for short-range indoor communication. The most prominent of this is the YGIG Alliance, which has a bunch of enhancements to the Wi-Fi standard for in-room high bandwidth communication. Because of this, there are a number of chip offerings from multiple vendors, which means that this is a good place to start because the hardware is already there. And you may be asking, if this band is so great, why aren't more people using it? And this has to do with its propagation characteristics. It's generally considered unsuitable for outdoor use because of higher oxygen absorption, rain fade, and tree attenuation, which is a fancy way of saying that the waves can't go through trees. Um, <laughs> additionally, the network's multi-hop, multi-point design means that it's got poor performance with existing layer two collision handling protocols. And finally, on the layer three side, there aren't existing easily extendable routing protocols for fast failure on such a large multi-hop uh, wireless network. But the spectrum is unlicensed, which means that we can iterate a lot faster because we're not blocked by differing legal restrictions, red tape, bureaucracy, and all of that sort of stuff. And you'll notice this sort of thing being a reoccurring pattern in this talk. So how do we go about solving the other existing problems? In, in order to deal with signal attenuation, we place the nodes pretty close together at about only 200 to 250 meters apart. And the vast bandwidth and signal absorbing nature of this frequency actually limits interference and really greatly simplifies network planning. Since it's designed to provide street level coverage, we also used a phase array antenna, 
which is able to change direction really quickly on the order of a couple of nanoseconds, which means that when links get broken or blocked, we're able to quickly reorient in search of other links. So this pretty much solved the issues of transmitting outside at this frequency, which means we're left with protocol issues at layers two and layer three. At layer two, we have issues multiplexing many signals across a single media as traffic increases. By default, YGIG uses carrier sense multiple access with carrier avoidance for, to handle congestion, and this is pretty similar to Wi-Fi, which uses the same except it uses y carrier detection instead of avoidance. So to give you an analogy of how this works, say you have a small group of people and they're having a conversation. Generally, people will wait for a break in the conversation before trying to talk. And if two people happen to start at the same time and interrupt each other, they'll generally you know, back off, maybe apologize, and wait a random amount of time before trying again. So this pr works pretty well for a small group of people, but imagine everyone in this hall trying to talk using that sort of protocol. It, it simply doesn't scale. So to get around this, we stripped off the existing protocol and replaced it with time division with mul multiple access. And this gave us much higher and more predictable performance under load, increasing our throughput by about six times on the same topology. So we still needed a routing proto protocol to handle the very large <laughs> multi-node network as well with fa fast failure handling. And existing protocols like OSPF and ISIS weren't really suitable for, for extension. So at this point you may be asking, does the world really need another protocol? And that's fair, we asked it internally a bunch as well. The problem with existing protocols is that changing and developing new protocols based on them is very slow. There's a lot of oversight and bureaucracy. You've got to maintain backwards compatibility because there are thousands of people and tons and tons of organizations already using these, which means that a lot of people have an opinion on what they should or should not become, which makes it very slow to get any change in on the order of months to years for even small changes. So enter OpenR. It's, it was originally developed for IPv6, and it's a custom layer three routing protocol that allows for fast failure recovery and low latency in wireless networks. And this, it solved many of our existing problems by making use of both a distributed and centralized approach. And at this point you may be going, but Nina, that doesn't make any sense. How can something be both distributed and centralized? And that's, that's a fair question. So on the distributed side, each node is able to handle failure, new links coming up, change in paths and the cost of links on its own. And because it's distributed throughout the network, this work is shared by all nodes, which may, means that each node is able to relatively quickly compute, um, compute the attributes of the local network around it, allowing for pretty fast convergence. The expense of computation, however, that still requires an overview of the whole network, like for example, calculating the optimum traffic engineered paths, is still possible via the cloud. And the cloud is then able to do these computations and disseminate the information out to each node, which gives us kind of like a nice combination of both the benefits of distributed and centralized computing, which helps open R to route fairly e efficiently within this kind of network with so many mesh nodes. So, these together, as well as, these together helped us get to the point where Teragraph could be designed for easy installation. And it's currently deployed at Facebook's campus. You can see these all around the campus um, with Wi-Fi names like My Little Teragraph. Um, and there are plans to deploy it in San Jose for some real world testing. San Jose is a town that's pretty close to the Facebook campus. We're also considering it for inclusion in the telecom infra project, which would mean that plan, the plans and hardware designs and software would become available to everyone, which brings us closer to a place where any vendor can start to deploy this sort of system. So to summarize stuff on Terragraph, Terragraph is a multi-node wireless network. It operates in high density urban areas on the unlicensed 60 gigahertz bands. It uses off-the-shelf components, meaning that it's optimized for high volume and low cost production. So that's hopefully a bit of a high level interview, overview into two of our terrestrial pro projects, Aries and Terragraph, with the aim to improve bandwidth for both urban and rural areas. But this doesn't really tell us anything about what to do for people who have no internet access at all. In the traditional model of connectivity, you have a tower that propagates radio signals out to people's devices. 
And in order to do this, mobile operators need extensive infrastructure. They need land rights, equipment, access to initial sources of fiber or microwave, and of course access to power to run all of this sort of stuff. Which means that using this model, reaching remote or low density areas becomes very financially difficult, as there are fewer potential customers and you have to build more infrastructure to reach them. Which means, not only that, but people living in these areas are often living in extreme poverty, which means it's highly unlikely that these operators will ever be able to recoup their costs. So while we've made tremendous progress, connecting more than 90% of the Earth's population to 2G in some form or another, getting to 100% is unlikely in the near term using conventional means. As, as providers are just gonna be simply unable to kind of recoup their investments. Which means that to avoid these issues, we've mainly focused on beaming internet from the sky, using low Earth orbits, low Earth orbit satellites, and unmanned aerial vehicles, as well as lasers. So we initially had plans to launch a satellite which would cover sub-Saharan Africa and provide access in areas not, exist not already covered by cell towers. This was part of SpaceX's Falcon 9 payload. And this didn't really go as planned. Um, there, there was an accident during testing, um, and the rocket and the satellite are no more. Real life, actual video. Um, so given the costs, this has largely been placed on hold, which means I'm gonna pretty quickly move on to another approach we're trying. So has anyone here heard of Aquila? Okay, a couple of people. Uh, it's the most well-known of Connectivity Labs projects, probably because it involves flying objects and lasers. And it aims to provide internet to remote areas through lightweight unmanned aerial vehicles. And these will fly at about 18 to 28 kilometers up and beam down internet in a 60 kilometer radius. So the mechanisms of this are as follows. Using an internet gateway somewhere on the ground, this will beam up internet to the UAV the UAVs in turn are able to share this internet and can communicate with each other via free space lasers. They're also then able to beam this internet down to communities below. And this is pretty cool because it means that you don't have to fly the UAVs directly near an urban center in order to get access to the internet. Instead, because you can mesh them, you can reach far greater distances that, are that would be normally unable to be reached with such a limited kind of radius. Of course, there are a number of challenges with this. They need to stay up for as long as possible with as little human interaction as possible. They also need to connect to each other via high-speed links so that they're able to rapidly send and receive data. And finally, if we're gonna hand this over to operators to manage on their own, they need to be low cost and easy to manage. So getting into some of the design around this, because Aquila will be flying above commercial air traffic and the weather, the air is very thin, at only about 5% that of sea level. Because of this, we want the wing aspect ratio to be as high as possible because this op optimizes lift to drag, which means that the plane needs to be really big. And in fact, its wingspan is greater than that of a Boeing 747. And here's an image with real little people in it to kind of give you an idea of the size. Of course, with such a big wingspan, it also needs to be as light as possible. And it weighs about a third of an electric car. Its single wing is made from a cured carbon fiber, which is stronger than steel for the same mass of material. And its low weight and large wingspan mean, means that it flies very slowly at only about 40 kilometers an hour. And this is in kind of direct contrast to conventional gliders or commercial aircraft, which actually means that we needed new aerodynamic models in order to model this, because there simply just isn't anything else flying at this speed. However, given the slow speed and the low drag, it also uses a very low amount of power, about as much as three hair dryers. And while it'll eventually include solar cells, initial test aircraft to use batteries. And this was so that we could get early indications of handling aerodynamic performance, the autopilot, so on and so on. Um, but the low power means that it can stay aloft for months at a time. However, all of these design things together are only really half of the story. In order for Aquila to succeed, the inter-vehicle communication is vital. So you may be asking, why lasers, other than the fact that I get to stand here and say lasers a couple of times. Um, mo most wireless communication technologies use the radio frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum. While free space lasers operate in the visible and infrared, and this has a couple of benefits. There's less interference, there's potential for far higher 
transfer rates, and it's not regulated, which means you don't have to worry about cross-country regulatory differences when flying 25 kilometers up. It also allows the teams to iterate much faster on this sort of technology. That said, of course, with any good thing, there, it has its own specific challenges. And this is because it works by transmitting laser light through air between transceivers that can be spaced hundreds of meters to hundreds of kilometers apart. But in order to maintain high speeds, the optical detectors need to be as small as possible. And in fact, to get a gigabit per second rate, you need an optical detector of one millimeter squared or less. And this is kind of problematic because laser beams expand the further they travel. And if the receiver is really, really small, it might receive only a portion of the data, which puts an obvious damper on shooting lasers through the air at a moving target 25 kilometers up. So in order to deal with this, improvements were made to both the receivers and the transmitters. On the transmitter side, improvements were made to allow transmitting over a distance of about 18 kilometers with the beam size of a dime, which, I had to look this up, is about the same size as a 20 cent coin. On top of this, this allowed for increased transmission speed by 10x that of existing benchmarks, with giving us speeds in the tens of gigabits. So this allows us to provide access to areas that are unable to be reached by conventional means. So Aquila is UAVs, they're light, they're, they use very little power, and they're designed to be run autonomously. They also use advances in free space laser communication, both to communicate with each other and with the ground. So to kind of go over where we are at the moment, I've gone over four, four projects, well, three or four, uh, but there are many more. And as for the things I've discussed, ARIES proof of concept has been built. Um, Terragraph is being actively deployed in San Jose as we speak. We have satellite insurance and are filling out claim forms. Um, and Aquila's first prototype has been successfully built. In fact, it recently completed its first flight. So while there are many remaining challenges, not least of which is driving down costs, Facebook has begun working with the industry in order to push the boundaries of technology. Everything you've seen here has been done in under two years by a relatively small team of very focused individuals, which means that the future is definitely looking bright. Questions? Hi, Nina. Um, uh, thinking specifically about Terragraph, do you plan to um, open source um, all of the things that you, uh, all of the innovations that you're making there, um, or license it to operators? And uh, how do you, do you foresee, um, uh, how would you deal with, or what do you foresee the possible impact of um, vendors taking what you've got and customizing it and making it proprietary? Um, okay. So we definitely are looking at making it public. Facebook st started something called the Open Telecom Initiative. Okay. Um, okay. So the Oca Open Telecom Initiative is basically Facebook and a bunch of other companies all working together with operators and other people who work in kind of telecommunications infrastructure. And these people are releasing plans and hardware and this sort of thing in order to kind of expand this field. So we're definitely considering adding it to that. As for people taking the technology and changing it and closed sourcing it, I, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty legal question. So I would guess that the licensing probably wouldn't allow for that, but I would have to defer to legal. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I noticed you didn't mention white spaces at all, which is um, going to be opening up in South Africa soon. Maybe that's for bandwidth issues, um, but it has a good distance and quite a lot of band, uh, quite a lot of uh, wavelengths. Anyway. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear the first word you said. Uh, white spaces. White spaces is um, taking um, analog TV offline and reusing that space for um, like a digital fill. 
that's cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that. I think that was more a statement than a question. Um, <laughs> definitely not included in the Vida. Uh, how are you going to keep those lasers pointing on the target from one dynamic platform to another over 18 Ks? Uh, sorry, I missed the end of this. I, I the, feel like this is an echo you, You're chamber. talking about a laser with a beam of one, you know, a few centimeters being aligned across 18 kilometers from one drone to another. Yeah, so the receiver is actually pretty interesting. I didn't really get into it, but they've created a receiver that is, you'd imagine a receiver is just something really small, but it actually looks almost like a hat, bear with me, with lots of strands that are able to collectively pick up the laser beam from multiple angles and then make sense of the data that's being sent. So the receiving surface is much bigger actually than the laser beam itself. Uh, so, so it struck me that a killer is literally a network in the sky. At any point, did you consider calling it Skynet? <laughs> Tempting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, how? Uh, Weatherproof and or maintainable will these, uh, especially the Aquila drones, be? So the idea is that Aquila will fly above the weather, so it won't have to worry about things like wind. Um, there's also very little else up there. Uh, generally, they're planning that they'll be up for about three months at a time and have minimal maintenance when they come down. It'll basically be one giant wing that is a solar panel with a laser attached to it. So there's very little moving parts on there and very little kind of actual infrastructure. Where's the return on investment for Facebook? So this is a lot of infrastructural investment that's happening. That's a lot of money that's going into these things. Where's the money? How's it going to be recouped? How do, you, how do you hope to actually make a return on this investment? So Facebook is a bit weird in this sense. They do a lot of things just because Mark Zuckerberg thinks they're important. Uh, so there is no solid monetary plan for this. Um, Facebook has, though, 1.8 billion users. So if we do want to continue to grow as an ecosystem, more people have to come online. And so Facebook has kind of taken it upon themselves to help with this process. There are other big companies doing the same. Google has like their weather balloon, internet things. So there are a lot of companies that have excess, ban uh, excess budget, I guess, that are making more money than they can realistically spend on just improving their core business and are doing things that are <laughs> philanthropic. Yeah. Plus, when they're up in the air, you can still put adverts for... <laughs> Are they, um, yeah, I just have a question about what are your methodologies for, like, for your engineering processes, like you with the engineering of the satellites and the, um, the UAVs, which is board, it's like, I mean, it's outside of software engineering, it's like system engineering in some sense. So is, is it still like break things quick? What's it? Yeah, 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 fast break. Yeah, so what, what are you like, follow like, stick in system engineering? Oh, no. I missed part of that, I'm sorry. Um, oh, yes, it's about your engineering um, like methodology for the UAVs and your satellites. Okay, yeah. uh, so in terms of, I can talk about the software side, I don't know that much about the hardware side, uh, but we have software engineering teams that work pretty much like software engineering teams everywhere else on Facebook. It's a very iterative approach. We try and test as much as possible on real hardware as much as possible. Uh, so the Terragraph guys, for example, guys and, guys and gals, um, they, they have devices in a lab that they're able to run their code on and see how stuff is being transmitted. Aquila actually runs in an office in the UK because they are willing to let them fly things there. Um, so they also, the engineers and the hardware, well, the actual engineers and the software engineers uh, work collaboratively together. It's a very iterative process, which is why generally we've gone for things that don't involve a lot of bureaucracy, because then you'd have to work to a point, get blocked by bureaucracy, deal with that, maybe it doesn't go your way. So that, that isn't very much in 
the Facebook methodology. Like a very often quoted Facebook slogan is move fast and break things, and people definitely do that. Yeah. Fly slowly and don't fall out of the sky. That one, new one. Yeah. Um, so obviously with a, light, a less atmosphere, up there, the square meter solar power that you're getting is quite high. What do you do at night? Because batteries are heavy. Pardon? Um, so at night, <laughs> sorry. At night, um, what plan for batteries do you have? Because during the day it's fine, but at night obviously batteries are too heavy. So the general idea is that the batteries will be able to absorb enough energy during the day to feed off the night as well. Um, my question relates to the other gentlemen. Um, I know in Sweden they've opened up the old analog spectrum, the FM spectrum, um, because that gives you really good penetration and all the mobile networks are, are starting to fight for it. So I was just wondering whether you literally considered going for the other end of the spectrum. So light is already fairly low in the kilohertz range, but like very low spectrum, um, how that, whether you considered that at all, because penetration is better, um, you, you can, it's probably a lot cheaper to build the, the technology around that. So it seemed like you went for the upper end of the spectrum. I, just, I was just wondering how that influenced your decision making. It seems really expensive to build all this stuff, while there are ways to bend signals literally around the globe if you go for fairly low frequencies. Sure, so I'm not sure if you're talking about a kilo here or all the stuff at 60 gigahertz. Um, but I would guess 60 gigahertz, since that's on the high end. Um. I was actually thinking of both. So in, in um, res or built, built up areas, whether you could go for something in, in, in a lower range, bec because penetration would just be better. Um, but, but even for, for the uh, high up in the air systems, you could go for something that's in the low frequencies. But, but you will have to battle for spectrum, I guess. So. Yeah, so that's exactly it. With both cases, the answer is that Spectrum is already so densely packed at those ranges because it has really nice propagation characteristics. And if we want to launch this not just in, say, the US or in some specific country, then this means going and sorting out the regulatory differences for every single country, which is a barrier to operators picking it up because then they have to go and do that. So picking a range that is generally okay and unlicensed means that things can move a lot faster. Um, I have a question. How much power does your lasers use that on the quill? quill oh, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. I, I can't give you exact figures, but very little. There's a paper actually published in Optical which discusses all of this technology and would have all of those specific details as well, which I can give you a link to afterwards if you want. Hi. I just want to know what devices do you foresee people in rural areas using to connect to the internet? Is it phones, is it laptops? Which phones and which laptops? So it would, the idea would be that Aquila would beam down internet using, six, using uh, free space lasers and other sort of technology to some sort of adapter which would take that and broadcast Wi-Fi. So anything that supports Wi-Fi, since that seems to be the general standard. Um, with Aquila, how many points can how many points can be made in the mesh network? Uh, so you've got presumably more than one laser on each um, drone. So well, it has to be more than one laser. But how many lasers are there? So that how complex can the mesh network get, and how many nodes can you lose out of it before the network goes down? So you don't actually need more than one laser because the laser bursts don't have to be continuous. They can be intermittent as you send data. Uh, so you can reorient and change the direction and send some data there or receive some data and then pass it on somewhere else, if that answers. Sorry. Okay, so it's, it's receiving the data via uh, standard um, megahertz range or whatever, um, and then it's transmitting from, from one drone to the other via laser. It's, um, well, the data it receives is also via laser. They're all lasers. Okay, but then I, do you have to repoint and reorientate the laser for, for, for so, uh, transmission and receival? So you can't have um, true MIMO type. 
transmitting and receiving. Uh, yeah, you reorient, but this, so the systems that do this, we, there is a lot of computation power behind this because you need to kind of track where the others are and reorient, so this stuff happens very fast. Is Facebook looking at battery technology because devices need batteries and rural areas? It's difficult to charge a phone. I can't talk about that. Um, just a question I'm interested to know um, the biggest assumption here is obviously the spectrum being unlicensed. Um, if that obviously becomes false, what then? So, because Facebook is such a large multinational country, company, they're working with various countries, various governments to try and ensure that that doesn't happen. If it does happen, then they'll deal with that. And a lot of the, the technology can be used at slightly different frequencies, but it would be a massive loss, of course. But, I mean, we've already lost a satellite, so... Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Nina. I just want to make sure for all our peace of mind that Facebook has put enough thought into not crossing the beams. <laughs> Something else I can't talk about. <laughs> we just want to see what happens. <laughs> okay, one more. Can the, laser, can the lasers be boosted to shoot down Google balloons? 